As of EF6, promises are now baked into the language. Now, before ES6, you could use a plethora of libraries to accomplish the same thing. In fact, jQuery has had promises built in for quite a while now. But now we have a standard in place that allows us to leverage a consistent API for promises. And actually, it's a standard that's backwards compatible as well. So we're going to take a look at using this with a new API that's being implemented in browsers as we speak. And I've seen pretty good support for this, so I think it's a good time to start talking about it because going forward, this is what you'll be using to make web requests instead of the XML HTTP requests and probably also instead of all the various libraries you might have used in the past. There's a new fetch API that's being worked on that'll allow you to succinctly make web requests using a promise-based API instead of a callback based API. Or I should say instead of a purely callback based API as promises still work with callbacks but just in a little bit different way. So this is what we're going to take a look at first just by using it. It's a pretty intuitive API so I want you to get a feel for it and then we're going to reverse the process and break this down and find out how it works as well as find out how promises work in the process. And again, keep in mind, our goal here is just to start being able to write asynchronous code that's much more easy to reason about and understand as opposed to callback based code like we saw before that can get very convoluted very quickly. So I've created an O2 fetch folder and inside of there is a fetch.js file. This is what we're going to use to take a look at this new fetch API and this new fetch API is conveniently accessible via a fetch function and to that fetch function you just pass the URL that you'd like to fetch and that's all you have to do to kick off a web request. Now, at some point in time, this is going to complete and you're going to want to take the resultant data and do something with it, perhaps log it out to the console. So obviously we have to get something back here. What is it that we get back? Well, it turns out what we get back here is a promise. A promise is an object. It's an object that represents the asynchronous operation that we've kicked off. So in this case, it represents making this web request. Now, one of the neat things about promises is that there's a then function that allows us to pass a callback. So we're still using callbacks here. It's a function that will be invoked later on. So exactly what you're used to, it's just been detached now from being passed to the original function or maybe being specific to an XML HTTP request. So if you remember with the callbacks, when we call set timeout, we pass the callback right in line. And with an XML HTTP request, we set some event handlers and we set those to the callback function that we'd like to have invoked. So now we have a consistent API for this. Any asynchronous operation that is promise based will now just have a then function, which is a nice way to standardize. If you remember from a moment ago, you saw that even the geolocation API used a different format here. Here we're passing a success and error handler at the same time when we're calling to get the current position. So that's different than the XHR and the set timeout operations. This then function takes a function and like many other situations with callbacks, this function will be passed some data. And in this case, it'll be a response object. We can go ahead and then log out that response object. And then let's hop over to the browser and see how this works. So let's run this HTML page. Control F9 is a shortcut, by the way pop open the dev tools and I'm going to split the screen here. Open up the response object so you can see we get back this nice response object in the browser. So that's how easy it can be to make a request. Let me split the screen here so we can see the response object again. Now somewhere on this response object is the data that we want and it happens to be on this body property. Our goal here should be getting back to having that array of museums. So somehow we have to turn this body property which we can come over to the API to learn a little bit more about and look for a body. And you should get some hint that this is a streaming response object. So we'll need some way to turn that streaming response into a JavaScript object. And if you come over here and click on this using fetch link, if you look through here, you're going to see some operations that can work on the body. And what you'll want to look for is a JSON operation. There's actually a series of operations you can use to work on this body object which will transform the response stream into whatever it is that you'd like. And in this case, we use the JSON operation to transform it into a JavaScript object. So we'll be parsing JSON that comes back. Now, I don't mean to throw you a curveball, but this is actually an asynchronous operation as well. 
because the process of performing the transformation on the response stream can take a while. So it's a nice thing actually that this is optimized in case this takes some computational time to not lock up your browser window, but this means we have another asynchronous operation. Let me show you what this looks like. So let's come over to our code. So this response object has a JSON method available. And this kicks off another asynchronous operation, much like our initial fetch. So this fetch here kicks off an asynchronous operation. So does this JSON method. So we're going to get something back here. And can you take a guess at what it is that we might get back? Well, it turns out to be another promise. So let's go ahead and create a variable to capture that. And let's call this the parse promise. So the promise that represents the result of parsing. And let's rename this other one to the request promise. So now, what is it that you think we'll have to do to get access to the resultant JavaScript object after the parsing is complete? Well, we need to chain a call here to then, and we'll get something back here, and this will be our museums array. And then we could come up inside of here, and we could log out the museums. Let's clean that up, come back to the browser, let's close some of these windows, and let's reload here. If this warning pops up about authorization, then follow along with changing this setting. I'll show you here in a minute to get this to stop popping up. You can come into the settings here and type in allow unsigned requests. You'll be popped into the debugger settings and just check this box here to allow unsigned requests with the debugger. And that message should go away then. Okay, so we've got our response and our array of objects. So it looks like we're actually parsing things out here now. So we now have replicated the behavior of our callback-based code. And let's split the screen here and take a look at that. So while this is still a bit to read through, and it's going to get better, I've got some more things to show you with this promise-based API, this is still a marked improvement over what we have on the right-hand side. There's actually two asynchronous operations here that are replacing what we have here. And it's already fewer lines of code, even though there are two asynchronous operations, whereas on the right-hand side, there's only one. So on the right-hand side here, when we call json.parse, this is a blocking call to parse the response text versus calling json over here on this new response object from the fetch API. This is non-blocking. So that's the difference, and that's why we have the second call here. The nice thing is, though, in this new version, this is non-blocking. So if this takes a while, we don't lock up the UI as a result, whereas this could lock up the UI on the right-hand side. So this is an introduction to the Promise API, though. Join me in the next video where we clean this up even further, taking advantage of other new aspects of Promises.